All right. Well, this first episode is called The Effectiveness of Julie and the Apostates Against the Galileans. And so this is going to be story time. Amen. We're going to go back in history and see something that probably almost no one knows about, no one talks about, no one knows about. But there are some really good uh, takeaways from the story of this particular person. Something very scary almost occurred less than 40 years after the Council of Nicaea. Something so dramatic, it almost snuffed out the Christian light in Constantine's Roman Empire. A rogue emperor almost single-handedly turned off the light, attempting to revive paganism, as well as writing a criticism of Christianity that was a shot heard around the world. Allow me to introduce you to someone who could be voted most likely to be smitten by God. His name is Julian the Apostate. Flavius Claudius Julianus, known as Julian, was the son of Julius Constantius, a half-brother of Constantine the Great. Now, if you remember the Constantines, even though they initiated and oversaw the Council of Nicaea, which resulted in the acceptance of Athanasianism, which would have been Trinitarianism, they were actually Arians. They were in that small 4% of the people who disagreed with the Athanasians. And of course, if you saw last year's symposium, we saw that Euthasius was the only apostolic one, this guy who was invited to the uh, council, and he was actually dismissed before it even started. So these guys were Arians. They were not classical Christians, according to the Catholic story. And so the whole family, all of the emperors were Arians, while the rest of the empire was Trinitarian. Now, Julian escaped the sword as many of as of, of as many of Constantine's relatives were killed not long after Constantine died. They wanted to cut down on how many people are going to be fighting for the throne. He was able to avoid all that. He was smuggled back and forth across the empire to protect him as well as to squeeze in an education in Christianity and Greek literature. During the course of his private education, he secretly converted to paganism. I think it was his uncle who inspired him. He kept this fact a secret from all but his closest of servants. Even though his conversion was highly intellectual, it was exercised through rituals. And Levinson says, although raised a Christian, by 351, Julian had privately rejected Christianity and became a passion, passionate adherent of Greek and Roman paganism. He adopted the Neoplatonism of the school of Iamblichus, which taught that union with the divine was to be achieved by ritual, especially animal sacrifice. He was particularly devoted to the solar deity Helios, whom he saw as the mediator between the visible and higher realms. In due time, Julian was elevated to the tetrarchal position of Caesar and was put to work with a sizable army pushing back the Germans. Remember, back in those days, there were four in charge. There were two Augustus or Augusti, and then there were two Caesars. The Caesars were the, sort of the disciples, and the Augusti were the reigning emperors of each side of the empire. So he, at this time, was a Caesar. And he was given an army. And after quite a bit of success, his soldiers promoted him to the status of emperor. And he assumed the purple as a gift of God's confidence. It was only upon the death of his uncle, Constantius II, who was approaching with his army to quell Julian's self-promoting enthusiasm, that Julian came out of the closet and declared his pagan convictions. Levinson tells us, Page two. On December 11, 361, Julian entered Constantinople as Augustus or emperor and initiated a series of political, economic, and religious measures aimed at eliminating corruption, reducing taxes, and promoting religious toleration and the revival of paganism. So Julian was determined to restore dignity to the position of emperor, to restore the glory of the Roman Empire and to revive paganism, which he thought had made the empire great to begin with. He was quickly lauded by the people for his tax reform and respected by the armies for his frugal lifestyle. He was upwardly mobile, charged with a purpose, and skilled at administration. 
much of which he personally undertook in the late hours of the night. There was, however, one particular blemish in the empire that caught his attention as the mission in his life to perform for the gods. Already says he had by nature an aversion to Christianity, but to this he added disgust with the endless doctrinal conflicts among the Christians and at the way the imperial power was caught up in them. He wanted to go back in history to the early ideas of Constantine when Christianity was no more than a tolerated religion and paganism was still the religion of the state. The Roman Empire he passionately sought to revive was one that he romantically imagined, like the wholesome 1950s in contrast to the wicked 1990s. Had he lived longer, many historians wonder if he could have produced the result or at least produced a simulation of this pagan ideal. Gregory Nazianus, one of the Christian leaders of the day, said, for if the God of martyrs had not checked his impiety, he's talking about God here, if God had not checked his imp impiety, nor had dried up like a poisonous stream his intended and concealed villainy, or cut it short by what means only he knew, according to his hidden wisdom in government, like as he suffered the iniquities of the Amorites to fill up their measure, but it was needful that his evil intention should be hated and his offering be rejected, for the edification of the multitude, and that the justice and purity of God with respect to the things offered unto himself should be manifested to the world. So Julian was a talented, a fine catch for any empire, except for his distaste for Christianity. In his early career, he brandished an army with amazing skill for one who had never received any military training. Nevertheless, he was to discover that his pen was mightier than the sword, and he brandished his pen very often. Michael Grant gives us a rundown of his voluminous writing career within his six short years as Caesar and two and a half years as emperor. <clears throat> he says he was more prolific author than any of the other Roman Empire emperors and exceeded all of them except only Marcus Aurelius in literary distinction. His admiration for pagan culture emerges strongly from his surviving speeches, essays, and letters in which he uses the Greek language of the day with confidence and skill. He also composed a commentary now lost in his own German campaigns. After he came to the throne, he began composing works propagating his personal and spiritual ideas. They included a, a prose hymn to the sun god. After the composition is addressed to the mother of the gods. The two others are directed against contemporary cynic philosophers who, according to Julian, were failing to live up to their founder, Diogenes. His beard hater, the poem, is a satirical re retort to the frivolous people of Antioch who had mocked his old-fashioned beard and simple way of life. Another piece of satire that has survived is the Caesars, passing each of the earlier Roman emperors in turn under sardonic review. Marcus Aurelius wins the prize, while Constantine's Christianity is derided for its easy abolition of sins, however one repeats them. But his letters, though hard to distinguish from numerous forgeries, contain valuable historical material and revelations of Julian's thinking. One fragment, to a priest, recommends the pagan priesthood to emulate the Christians in their teaching of morality. But this is one of the biggest takeaways in the life of uh, Julian, is that the pagans just didn't have what Christianity had. Didn't have the passion, didn't have the selflessness, didn't have the love for humanity. And then we're going to talk more about that. Why can't you be like the Christians? Just don't be Christian, but why can't you be like them? For a villainous emperor, he was very well documented and had his numerous works preserved through the ages, which is kind of unusual. Usually anyone that the Roman Catholic Church hated, they pretty much destroyed everything that person ever wrote. So we don't have any writings of Praxius, no, none of the writings of Noetus, none of the writings of Sibelius. All we have are quotations from their documents. But they held on to his stuff, which is kind of odd. Um, sometimes to document the life of one who dared to spurn Christ. Here's what happens if you live this way. It's a lesson to be learned. And sometimes used as an example of stunning Greek craftsmanship. For he was one who creatively wove words into original and pithy phrases, whether in praise to himself or common situations. We shall now describe his ministry, which led to the creation of the now infamous document known as Contra Galilea, Galileus, or Against the Christians, or Against the Galilean. 
religious reforms. Julian assumed the position and title of Pontifax Maximus. In other words, he's going to be the, the priest of priests of all religions. And he required that all priests of all religions submit to him as the ultimate authority in all matters religious. He did this in full confidence that he was more zealous than all, having been placed in this position of authority by the gods, and that he had the ability to bring forth a revival of paganism that was long overdue. His first step in the beginning of the persecution of Christians was the removal of unnecessary privileges, a reversal of the last 50 years of administration, which had brought this reproach upon the empire and had caused such unnecessary inconvenience upon its emperors. Grant says, when therefore he himself came to the throne while proclaiming toleration of any and every religion, he deprived the Christian church of its financial privileges. And amid the disorders that inevitably followed, its members were penalized more rigorously than pagan offenders. This edict of toleration was similar to that of 311 by Emperor Galerius, in which the ban on Christianity was lifted in all religions, even other previously banned ones were given free reign to worship unmolested. However, in this case, the ban was specifically for the liberation of pag paganism. This edict opened the door for Julian to begin pumping funds from the imperial treasury back into the temples where interest and activity had been waning since the funding had been restricted in previous administrations. Now, what many observers have noted now and even as early as Julian's own day by his Christian critics is how Julian harbored a secret envy for the Christian charity and zeal. Even though Christianity had enjoyed large financial support from the empire, Christians still persisted in good works even after the funds had been denied by the, from the royal coffers, something that the pagans lacked and which Julian thought would be a natural extension of the true religion. Dark says, and as we have seen, that is precisely what most concerned Julian as he worked to reverse the rise of Christianity and restore paganism. But for all that he urged pagan priests to match these Christian practices, there was little or no response because there was no doctrinal basis or traditional practices for them to build upon. It was not that Romans knew nothing of charity, but that it was not based on service to the gods. Pagan gods did not punish ethical violations because they imposed no ethical demands. Humans offended gods only through neglect or by violation of ritual standards. Since pagan gods required only propitiation and beyond that left human affairs in human hands, a pagan priest could not preach that those lacking in the spirit of charity risked their salvation or the crops not growing or their animals not reproducing. Indeed, the pagan gods offered no salvation. They might be bribed to perform various services, but the gods did not provide an escape from mortality. Now, here's a funny incident. His visit to Antioch. These were the guys who sort of mocked him for his beard. To make a long story short, Julian visited Antioch, a city which he had considered the buckle of the pagan belt. He was only too disappointed by the proliferation of Christians in local politics, the lack of care that had been taken of the Oracle of Apollo and Daphne. That was like one of the high points. That was one of the biggest deities in Roman Empire. It was right here in Antioch, and they were just, it was overgrown with weeds and falling apart. And for the Antiochians themselves, who could not appreciate his rugged lifestyle and rough beard, on the highest holiday of this one particular god, the most zeal that he could stir up locally resulted in one of the governors volunteering a goose for the sacrifice. That's it. That's not much enthusiasm. It was here that he set his pen down to create a series of edicts against Christianity and his finest attack upon Christ himself. Peretti says he removed Christian teachers from the schools on the ground that they were incompetent to explain the text of pagan literature. He canceled privileges granted to the Christians, and he put into circulation once more all the polemic and accusation directed against him by the Jews and by Celsus, Porphyry, and others. These were Celsus and Porphyry wrote these big uh, accusations about the errors of the Bible, and it made challenges. They'd already been answered, but he pulled it back up again ignored the answers and, and presented them to the public once, one, once more. The ban on Christian teachers was considered extreme even to the pagans, where there were hundreds of competent, inspiring Christians employed to explain Plato and Greek philosophy. This was recognized as his first step down. 
Peretti says victory over the Persians was intended to bear witness to protection and power of the ancestral gods. When this failed and Julian died, the whole undertaking came to an end. Though it had brought ruin to thousands and led to violence, its author had never intended. He actually stretched himself a little bit, thinking this is going to prove that everything I'm doing has the approval of the gods. And then he died. It didn't work. Julian's defeat and death resulted in not only the loss of many soldiers, but of Nisbis as well, a key city on the border between Roman and Persian empires. This city, under a strong Christian leadership, had defended itself very successfully against previous Persian attacks. To give Nisbis to the Persians as a concession to allow the Roman army to retreat unmolested was viewed as the sour fruits of the bitter grape and was viewed as divine justice. God would not would let no benefit come to the empire run by a blasphemous infidel. Everyone saw this as God's condemnation of the pagan. So what about his book? There are different reports as to how many volumes were in the original edition of Julian's Against the Christians. Some say there were five, seven, or ten volumes, but these numbers may differ only in reference to how many volume were created by the current copyists. We believe that we only have fragments from volume one, so there were probably so much more written, perhaps of a different nature than what has been preserved through Cyril of Alexandria's writings. His reliance upon porphyry. Although there exists a long heritage of Christian denunciators, people who've attacked Christianity, there seems to be quite a bit of original material in Julian's text. Some say that Julian derived most of his diatribe from Porphyry, who pulled most of his data from Celsus, and even Celsus relied heavily upon one book for his criticism. When Celsus encountered the Stromatus of Origin, it's a book on exegetical difficulties. You know, it says, let's just recognize there's some difficulties, I'll call them out, and I'll show you how to explain them. Robert Grant believes that Porphyry frowned that most of his anti-Christian tasks had been done for him. All he had to do was take Origen's negative statement about the scripture passage, neglect the allegorical answer, and use it as a basis for criticism. This was a great source of instant information. Julian certainly had access to Celsus and Porphyry's present extinct manuscripts. Nevertheless, he must be credited with using his unique charm and skill with the Grecian quill. Schaff says, he repeated the arguments of Celsius and Porphyry in modified form, expanded them by a larger acquaintance with the Bible, because after all, he was trained as a young one. But he, had, he had learned according to the letter of his clerical education and breathed into it all the bitter hatred of an apostate, which agreed ill with his famous toleration and entirely blinded him to all that was good in his opponents. The Contents Although Julian gave credit to the factual truth of the contents of both the Old and New Testaments, he says these things happen. He aimed his attacks upon one, the Christian worship of a man, two, the incorrect confusion of Yahweh with the supreme being, and three, attacked Christianity for being a trendy modern farce of a religion. Levinson says, although he regarded the biblical account of creation as inferior to the Platonic and the prophets as inferior to the oracles, he respected the Jews as adherents of a traditional religion based on sacrifice. Because again, his Helios was sacrifice-based religion. For that reason, and to refute Christian claims of the obsolescence of Judaism, he issued orders in early 363 to rebuild the Jerusalem Temple, a project that was aborted by fires on the site. Now, I've just been keeping an eye on it as a church history teacher. I've always tried to find out when and who have tried to rebuild the temple, and God has always stopped an attempt at the third temple. Constantine's mom loved the Jews, and she wanted to build a temple. She was forbidden to build a temple. This guy tried to build a temple just to irritate the Christians, and he was forbidden to build a temple. So there's going to be a third temple built, and but God's going to make sure it's number three. <laughs> Amen. Right. Julian charges the apostles, particularly John and Paul, with the idea of the divinity of Christ, something he insists that Jesus did not teach and that Moses would never tolerate. The rhetoric had a particular strength because of Julian's intimate knowledge of the scriptures due to his early education. Something that we must consider is the duration of airtime that this book enjoyed. 
having several hundred pages per copy and being copied by hand and being read by the educated, we must wonder how quickly did the first copies get out? How long did it enjoy the limelight? And was Julian dead before the work had a chance to make the New York Times bestseller list? Because Julian's body had, as we say, assumed room temperature within half a year from the publication of the book. He completed it in January 363 and was dead in June. Perhaps he never got word of the reviews. If so, then who continued to push this document upon the public? Was it his mentor, Libanius, or the entire union of pagan priests? These questions will have to remain conjecture, but it brings us to believe that the document was not promoted by the imprimatur of the emperor, and thus other forces were strongly at work. Was it propelled by the force of his own merit? Wilkin tells us Julian's work made a deep impression on Christians, and it was it, it was still being read in the middle of the fifth century. So a hundred years later, it's still being read and causing consternation. If this is true, then certainly it was the chilling words of a challenge to people's spiritual experience that kept it alive. I doubt that it had made such an impact as described above for reasons given below, but the message lasted much longer than the messenger and enjoyed a shelf life exponentially longer than the reign of the emperor who penned it. So how do we measure its effectiveness or the impact? This section sincerely requires a question mark in its title, since there should be many ways to evaluate the effectiveness of anti-Christian polemic. However, there appears to be very little immediate evidence of its effect. Most of it, the data that is available comes from Cyril, who wrote a brave rebuttal 70 years after it had been presented to the public. Surely if this epistle had stirred the waters more vehemently, it would have been very well documented by pagans and Christians alike. If, if, if churches would have shut down, if whole regions would have dropped their Christianity, we would have known about it. Yeah. Those who have written responses will be discussed in the next section, but let us read how the original audience responded to the message published. As a result, Wilkin says, many pagans reproached Christians up and down. They cast his writings against us and assert that they are incomparably skillful and none of our teachers is capable of rebutting or refuting his ideas. So Julian's Contra Galileos was a big hit with the pagans. Certainly the fact that Julian quoted from the scriptures, argued logically, exercised his original wit with skill and ease, would result in a pleasing document that those who rejected Christ would rejoice in. It was Julian's skill that was one of the key objects of affection. The other accusation, that none of the Christian teachers could or did rebut or refute his ideas, bears with it the weight that it has been 70 years in print without a suitable refutation. So how else did the pagan community respond in light of this work? Schaff says, after the death of Julian, most of the heathen writers, especially the ablest and most estimable, confined themselves to the defense of their religion and thus became, by reason of their position, advocates of toleration and of course of toleration for the religious syncretism, which in its cooler form degenerates into philosophical indifferentism. In other words, they're saying, since Christianity is going through a bit, maybe a bit of a, a wobble here and we've been elevated, we really need to promote our own organizations and, 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 and say toleration, keep toleration going because we need to have a foot in the door. The pagan apologists after the death of Julian the Apostate wrote defenses of paganism but not to the supreme place as Julian did. They knew that Jovian, the following emperor, who took over from Julius, his return of the Roman Empire to Christianity, and this time the non-Aryan type, was probably a permanent move, and any arguments for its reversal would have been in vain. Instead, they formed a lobby that argued for freedom of religion in an attempt to retain as many empire privileges and financial funding as possible. They weren't cowering in fear as much from Jovian's reversal of Julian's advances, mostly because of the strength of against the Galileans, which was making its circles through the intellectual circles. They were emboldened by it. This document surely lengthened the legitimacy of pagan worship in the empire and perhaps even worked to balance out the divine lesson taught by God in such a sudden and sad fall by such a wicked emperor. Whatever heathenism lost by reputation through Julian's fall was recovered by Julian's polemic. Another way to judge the effectiveness of a vindictive work is through the efforts of those being assailed to destroy it. The historical story tells a lot more of the effectiveness of Julia's, Julian's work than personal testimony indicates. 
Libanus, always a blind admirer of Julian, says that in this treatise, the emperor made the doctrines of the Christians look ridiculous, and that he was wiser than a Tyrian old man, that is Porphyry, the guy who had previously critiqued Christianity. But the Christians of the next two centuries did not agree with Cyril as to the peculiar dangerous character of Julian's invective. At any rate, the Council of Ephesus, in a decree dated 3431, sentenced Porphyry's books to be burned, but did not mention Julian's. And again, in a law of Theodosius II in 448, Julian was ignored while Porphyry was condemned. And when in 529, Justinian decreed that anti-Christian books were to be burned, Porphyry alone was named. So it makes you wonder, was Julian just overrated at the time and forgotten? It seems odd, or maybe they even to say Julian's just a rehash of Porphyry. Porphyry, down with Porphyry, you know, and that would include Julian. It seems odd that the most recent attack upon Christianity, the admittedly most thorough, skillful, and irrefutable defense, and one which should be the most sensitive, tore upon the empire's conscience, should fail to receive a mention. Either Cyril was exaggerating as to the toxicity of Julian's masterpiece, as Levinius did from the other side, or it was considered to be too much of a rehash of poor free to deserve, to deserve its own mention. What evidence do we have that Julian's contra Galileos put upon some of the Christians? Let us compare two quotes from Wilkin and Wright to find something indicative that negates the need for personal testimony. Like the books of Celsus and Porphyry, Julian's work was destroyed, but much of it can be recovered from a 5th century refutation written by Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria from 412 to 444. In Cyril's Contra Julian, Julianum, in other words, against Julian, Julian's book is cited extensively, and from it we gain a clear idea of the character and content of the work. And practically, practically everything we know from Julian's text comes to us through Cyril. However, it has been filtered for justifiable reasons. Moreover, he says that he omitted invectives against Christ and other such matter as might contaminate the minds of Christians. We have seen that similar mutilation of the letters occurred for similar reasons. There was some material considered to be either too blasphemous to repeat or too effective to reproduce. Either way, there is evidence that Julian's work did have potency as serial as serial comments. And here we are reading Cyril's defense. He says, indeed, the light-minded and easily seduced fall easily into his sights and constitute a welcome amusement for the demonic powers but not spirits strengthened in the faith, which do not let themselves to be disturbed sometimes. Very many followers of superstition, when they meet Christians, overpower them with any kind of sarcastic remarks and rely on the works of Julian to attack us, which they proclaim to be of incomparable effectiveness. Certainly Christianity in the early Christian empire had many souls who were weak social Christians. These would be immediate prey, especially in the first few months while the apostate was still alive. And popular Christianity was losing the adjective popular. These Christians would be those who took the name but did not commit by strengthening themselves in the faith. Because again, it was popular. If you wanted a position, it's much more easier to get that position if you proclaim yourself to be a Christian without doing anything to become a Christian. Julian's books had disturbed many and done much harm, writes Cyril. Simple and impressionable Christians fell sway to his ideas. But what is more, even those who are strong in faith were troubled because they thought that he knew the Holy Scriptures. And it's always a bit more disturbing to hear someone who knows the Scriptures recant the Scriptures than someone who knows nothing of what the Scriptures say. Cyril takes one step further and includes those who are strong in faith as being among those disturbed, but not necessarily converted by Julian's diatribe. Again, he mentions only those Christians who would be considered weak by their commitment, not necessarily by their mental abilities or lack of intellectual training, as being the victims of this attack on the faith. Julian's legal approach was probably more effective than his written. He more likely converted more Christians to paganism through his adjustment of the social position of Christianity than through his voluminous indictment. Ephraim of Syria, in his first hymn against Julian, mentions the lead seed, how it feared and quaked. And by the phrase, the late seed Ephraim made reference to those who had converted back to paganism in order to acquire political gain. They were recent converts who had joined Julian's repertoire and who, upon hearing of Julian's ignominious 
calamity or in fear of unemployment and or persecution. Regretfully, both Christianity and paganism experience growth of this very shallow kind. Nothing much has changed in politics. If the numbers were to be counted and only God knows, the number of con converts for political gain would probably outnumber the converts for philosophical or religious reasons due to Julian's manuscript. Elizabeth Clark of Duke University diffuses Cyril's defense with this. It's possible that later Christian replies to Julian were more literary exercises than tracks for the times. Just as Prudentius's Persephonon leads no one to posit pagan persecution of Christians in his era, no more do Cyril's blast against Julius. Julian suggest that Christianity was suffering serious onslaught from either paganism or Judaism of his day. It might have just been an exercise just to say at least someone did it and did it well. If this were true, then Cyril would need to whip up a spiritual need for his reputation and exaggerate the effectiveness of Julian's work. Since it is almost, he is almost the only one who mentions casualties, then this just may be the case. It might not have been as bad as he says. He's just whipping up a need for his own book. Responses to the polemic. A good way to evaluate the effectiveness of an attack is to analyze the history of the counterattack. The more of a threat that it poses, the more likely it is to be exposed and refuted. A recent verification of this phenomenon is the sudden appearance of anti-Da Vinci Code books that filled the Christian bookstores after the release of the book and the deluge that arrived with the movie. You remember those days? I mean, the bookshelves were full of books, thick books and skinny books on how to uh, on how to explain away all the inconsistencies and all the attacks against Christianity from the Da Vinci Code. Dozens of them. So that, that showed that, that the Da Vinci Code was considered to be a strong attack. Not long after Julian's death, his fellow student at Athens, Gregory of Nazianzen, wrote a long invective after him, against him. Others in the fifth century, such as Theodorus of Montsuestia and Philip Sedita, wrote refutations which are lost. So we got about maybe three or four educated refutations. And Gregory was the first to cast stones. And it's worth noting that he was one of Julian's peers. Although Gregory rejects vehemently the message of Julian's essay, he did not refute any of the allegations it contained. And this was the only contemporary response. Elizabeth Clark continues, first it's noteworthy, noteworthy that many of the key Christian responses were composed decades after the attacks were leveled. Thus we cannot hold that the Christian responders were in dialogue with the pagans at least not with the pagans they named. Moreover, when they considered that the main audience for the theologian's work was surely other Christians, we must question as to what extent the treaties were part of a living debate, to what extent products of a rhetorical tradition. There is doubt that there really was really a need for Cyril's work. The only outstanding need in relation to Julian's polemic was simply a professional refutation, simply to add closure to the heretics' rantings and ravings. But it was reserved for Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria, writing between 429 and 441 to compose a long and formal reputation of Julian's treatise. The latter seems to have been no longer in circulation or was at least neglected. And Newman thinks that the bishop was urged to write his polemic by his dislike of the heretical views of other and earlier antagonists of Julian, especially Theodorus. They were reading the previous reviews and thought they didn't do a good job of it. So let's do it right. For many, Julian's contra Galileos did not even factor into the debate. Julian attempted to eradicate Christianity's foundations, but it appears that when the apostate disappeared, so too did the threat. And Cook summarizes that Cyril of Alexandria, who transmitted over 70 years later the fragments of Julian's work against the Galileans, wrote that it shook up many people who then became the sweet prey of demons. Julian's short-lived revival of paganism did not include violent persecutions of the church, but Christians breathed a sigh of relief when he died in a campaign against the Persians. And now for a historical assessment and conclusion. Julian lived in a still divided world. Since 313, when Christianity was recognized as a licit or legal cult by Roman government, and Constantine had embraced the Christian religion, the emperors had been Christian. But the Roman Empire had not become a Christian state overnight, much less a Christian society. It was not until 380 CE, 17 years after Julian's death, that the Emperor Theodosius I proclaimed Christianity the official religion of the Roman world. 
So Julian has to be put into context. His tiny career, which had created such a huge blemish in this transition era, is embarrassingly sandwiched between the Nicene Council and Christianity's declaration of the empire's official religion. So in 311, Christianity was legalized. It was no longer being persecuted. 325, the Council of Nicaea, led by Constantine, showed Christianity to have the great favor of the emperor. It became popular, trendy, and many people joined it, probably just because of that trendiness of it. In 355, 20, 30 years later, Julian was appointed Caesar. In 361, he was declared emperor. In 362, he issued the freedom of religion, that uh, edict of toleration for all the other religions and make them, illegal, make them legal again. His bans on paganism were lifted. And then he had the laws on the school teachers in June, bans on Christian teachers. And then in July of that year to March of the next year, he went to Antioch to attempt to revive pagan enthusiasm, and it failed. In January 363, he wrote against the Galileans, and in April he attacked the Persians. In June, he was killed by the Persians. And then less than 17 years later, Christianity was declared the official religion. I'm sure he was rolling in the grave. So who knows? It's possible that maybe he was, maybe he served a purpose to show the importance of protecting Christianity, showing the impotence and the uselessness of paganism. In summary, it seems to be divine justice to share a positive benefit that can be gleaned today by Julian's work, which both challenged believers and placated pagans of their day. Dr. Kippis said, he has borne a valuable testimony to the history and to the books of the New Testament, as all must acknowledge who have read extracts just made from his work. He allows that Jesus was born in the reign of Augustus at the time of the tax he made by Judea, Judea, uh, made in Judea by Cyrenius. He bears witness to the genuineness and authenticity of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the Acts of the Apostles. He quotes them as to intimate that those were the only historical books received by Christians as of authority and the only authentic memoirs of Jesus Christ and his apostles and the doctrine preached by them. He allows their early date and even argues for it. He does not deny the miracles of Jesus Christ, but allows them to have healed the blind and the lame and demoniacs, and to have rebuked the winds and walked upon the waves of the sea. He aimed to overthrow the Christian religion, but has confirmed it. His arguments against it are perfectly harmless and insufficient to unsettle the weakest Christian. Perfectly harmless may be an overstatement, for an intelligent invective is sure to produce its share of casualties. But as far as history and popular testimony bear witness, it must have been really ineffective, especially seen in light of the fact that it failed to deserve a mention in the decrees against anti-Christian literature. Something that's even more telling is that less than 20 years after its publication, the empire adopted Christianity without reservation or hesitation as the official religion. So he was a little blip, a little... A uh, little pimple that came and went, and uh, and he may have inspired some sort of cleanser. You know, he may have, he may have inspired making Christianity the official religion and driving out paganism, which, when given one last chance of funding and benevolence and charity, totally failed to do anything more than just produce someone who can donate a goose. So let's take a look at some quotes from against the Galileans. He says, but consider whether God has not given us also gods and kindly guardians of whom you have no knowledge. God's in no way inferior to him who from the beginning has been held in honor among the Hebrews of Judea, the only land that he chose to take thought for down to our time. So he's trying to say, listen, maybe there's other gods out there, not just your God. Maybe there's maybe other nations have gods just as, as capable as yours. He's trying to open up their minds to, to polytheism. But has God granted to you to originate any science or any philosophical study? Why was it? For the theory of the heavenly bodies was perfected among the Greeks after the first observation had been made among the barbarians in Babylon. And what's funny, you know, he's he's accusing the Jews of not having contributed to uh, any science or knowledge or astronomy. But since then, they've won 20% of all the Nobel Peace Prizes, and they're only 1 20th of 1% of the population. So, yes, they have achieved quite a bit. Um, but when he became man, what benefits did he confer to his own kinfolk? 
May the Galileans answer. He, 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 he knows how he doesn't call them Christians. He calls them Galileans. Anyone who follows the Galilean is a Galilean. That's why he calls it against the Galileans. That's a smug way of saying against the Christians without confessing he's Christ. Nay, Galileans answer, they refuse to hearken to Jesus. What? How was it that when this hard-hearted and stubborn people hearkened unto Moses, but Jesus, who commanded the spirits and walked on the sea and drove out demons, as you yourselves assert, made the heavens and the earth, could not this Jesus change the dispositions of his own friends and kinsfolk to the end that he might save them? So he used the rejection of the Jews as an argument that maybe he wasn't who he said he was. And then finally, but the worthy John, since he perceived that a great number of people in many of the towns of Greece and Italy had already been infected by this disease, was the first to venture to call Jesus God. So he again claims that Peter and John were the ones that came up with the idea that Jesus was God and not that it was part of the whole story of the Old Testament as well. All right, so there's a little snapshot of history. I mean, even he, not only his document, but now he is like an unknown. I mean, almost no one knows about Julian the Apostate. If you run into someone who knows Julian the Apostate, they get excited. You know about Julian? Let's talk about him because, you know, he's, it's such a rare topic. He's such a blip. He's such a, a, a two and a half year pimple on the on the empire of Rome. Yeah. And uh, and, he, and he made a big noise and he tried to revive and, and he was so envious. He was so irritated with the pagans because they just couldn't produce the charity they don't they, they don't start hospitals they don't start orphanages they don't do nothing all they do is kill animals and and and, and people are getting have already gotten kind of tired of that so yeah a lot of envy there a lot of hatred there recycling old uh alleged bible discrepancies in fact anyone can do that now go out and buy a book on alleged bible discrepancies list all the discrepancies and then throw away the answers and you've got yourself a powerful book man and you can become a threat against christianity so what do you guys think about Julian?